The following prayers are taken from the book, The Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul by Philip Doddridge. Some of these prayers were edited and placed in the book, The Valley of Vision by Arthur Bennett, but this is a reading from the book itself. The meditation of a sinner who was once thoughtless but begins to be awakened. Awake, O oh, my forgetful soul, awake from these wandering dreams. Turn from this chase of vanity, and for a little while be persuaded to look forward, to look upward, at least for a few moments. Sufficient are the hours and days given to the labors and amusements of life. Don't grudge a short allotment of minutes to view yourself and your own immediate concerns, to reflect who and what you are, how it comes to pass that you are here, and what you must quickly become. It is indeed as you have seen it now represented, O my soul. You are the creature of God, formed and furnished by Him, and lodged in a body which He provided and which He supports, a body in which He intends you only a transitory abode. Oh, think how soon this tabernacle must be dissolved, and you must return to God. And shall He, the One, Infinite, Eternal, Ever-blessed and ever-glorious being, shall he be least of all regarded by you? Will you live and die with this character, saying by every action of every day to God, Depart from me, for I do not desire the knowledge of your ways. The morning, the day, the evening, the night, every period of time has its excuses for this neglect. But, O oh my soul, what will these excuses appear when examined by his penetrating eye? They may delude you, but they cannot impose upon him. O oh, you injured, neglected, provoked benefactor, when I think but for a moment or two of all your greatness and of all your goodness, I am astonished at this insensibility which had prevailed in my heart and even still prevails. I blush and am confounded to lift up my face before you. On the most transient review I see that I have played the fool, that I have erred exceedingly, and yet the stupid heart of mine would make its having neglected you so long a reason for going on to neglect you. I own it might justly be expected that with regard to you every one of your rational creatures should be all duty and love that each heart should be full of a sense of your presence, and that a care to please you should swallow up every other care. Yet you have not been in all my thoughts. And religion, the end and glory of my nature, has been so strangely overlooked that I have hardly ever seriously asked my own heart what it is. I know if manners rest here, I will perish. Yet I feel in my perverse nature a secret indisposition to pursue those thoughts, a proneness if not entirely to dismiss them, yet to lay them aside for the present. My mind is perplexed and divided, but I am sure you who made me know what is best for me. I therefore beseech you that you will for your own name's sake lead me and guide me. Let me not delay till it is forever too late. Pluck me as a brand out of the burning. Oh, break this fatal enchantment that holds down my affection to objects which my judgment comparatively despises. And let me at length come into so happy a state of mind that I may not be afraid to think of you and of myself and may not be tempted to wish that you had not made me or that you could forever forget me that it may not be my best hope to perish like the brutes. If what I shall further read here be agreeable to truth and reason, if it be calculated to promote my happiness, and is to be regarded as an intimation of your will and pleasure to me, O God, let me hear and obey. 
Let the words of your servant, when pleading your cause, be like goads to pierce into my mind. And let me rather feel and smart than die. Let them be as nails fastened in a sure place that whatever mysteries is yet unknown, or whatever difficulties there are in religion, if it be necessary, I may not finally neglect it, and that, if it be expedient, to attend immediately to it, that I may no longer delay attending to thee things. And, O oh, let your grace teach me the lesson I am so slow to learn and conquer, that strong opposition which I feel in my heart against the very thought of it. Hear these broken cries for the sake of your Son, who has taught and saved many a creature, as untractable as I am, and can out of stones raise up children of Abraham. Amen. The second prayer is a prayer for one who is tempted to delay applying to religion though under some conviction of its importance. O thou righteous and holy sovereign of heaven and earth, thou God in whose hand my breath is, and whose are all my ways, I confess I have been far from glorifying you, or conducting myself according to the intimations or the declarations of your will. I have therefore reason to adore your forbearance and goodness that you have not long since stopped my breath and cut me off from the land of the living. I adore your patience that I have not months and years ago been an inhabitant of hell where 10,000 delaying sinners are now lamenting their folly and will be lamenting it forever. But, O oh God, how possible is it that this trifling heart of mine may at length betray me into the same ruin, and then, alas, into a ruin aggravated by all this patience and forbearance of yours? I am convinced that, sooner or later, religion must be my serious care, or I am undone. And yet my foolish heart draws back from the yoke. Yet I stretch myself upon a bed of sloth and cry out for a little more sleep, a little more slumber, a little more folding of the hands to sleep. So does my corrupt heart plead for its own indulgence against the conviction of my better judgment. What shall I say? O oh Lord, save me from myself. Save me from the artifices and deceitfulness of sin. Save me from the treachery of this perverse and degenerate nature of mine, and fix upon my mind what I have now been reading. O Lord, I am now being instructed in truths which were before quite unknown to me. Often have I been warned of the uncertainty of life, and the great uncertainty of the day of salvation, and I have formed some light purposes and have begun to take a few irresolute steps in my way toward a return to you. But alas, I have been only, as it were, fluttering about religion, and have never fixed upon it. All my resolutions have been scattered like smoke, or dispersed like a cloudy vapor before the wind. Oh, that you would now bring these things home to my heart with a more powerful conviction than it is ever yet felt. Oh, that you would pursue me with them, help me to flee from them. If I should even grow mad enough to endeavor to escape them any more, may the Spirit address me in the language of effectual terror, and add all the most powerful methods which you know to be necessary to awaken me from this lethargy, which must otherwise be mortal. May the sound of these things be in my ears when I go out, and when I come in, when I lie down and when I rise up, and if the repose of the night and the business of the day be for a while interrupted by the impression, be it so, O oh God, if I may but by this carry on my business with you to better purpose, and at length secure a repose in you, instead of all that terror which I now find when I think upon God and I am troubled. 
O Lord, my flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. I am afraid lest even now that I have begun to think of religion, you could cut me off in this critical and important moment before my thoughts grow to any ripeness and let eternal death set in the first buddings and openings of it in my mind. But, O oh, spare me, I earnestly entreat you, for your mercy's sake. Spare me a little longer, it may be. Through your grace I shall return. It may be if you continue your patience toward me a little longer, there may be some better fruit produced by this cumberer of the ground. And may the remembrance of that long forbearance which you have already exercised towards me prevent my continuing to trifle with you and with your soul. From this day, O Lord, from this hour, from this moment, may I be able to date more lasting impressions of religion than have ever yet been made upon my heart by all that I have ever read or all that I have heard. Amen. The next prayer is from the chapter called The Sinner Arraigned and Convicted. Confession of a Sinner Convinced in General of His Guilt. O oh God, you injured sovereign, you all-penetrating and almighty judge, what shall I say to these charges? Shall I pretend I am wrong by them and stand on the defense in your presence? I dare not do it. For you know my foolishness, and none of my sins are hid from you. My conscience tells me that a denial of my crimes would only increase them and add new fuel to the fire of your deserved wrath. If I justify myself, my own mouth will condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it will also prove me perverse. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. They are, as I have been told in your name more than the hairs of my head therefore my heart fails me I am more guilty than it is possible for another to declare or represent my heart speaks more than any other accuser and you O Lord are much greater than my heart and know all things what has been my life but a course of rebellion against you it is not this or that particular action alone I have to lament. Nothing has been right in its principles and views and ends. My whole soul has been disordered. All my thoughts, my affections, my desires, my pursuits have been wretchedly alienated from you. I have acted as if I had hated you, who art infinitely the loveliest of all beings as if I had been contriving how I might tempt you to the uttermost and weary out your patience, marvelous as it is. My actions have been evil, my words yet more evil than they, and, oh, blessed God, my heart, how much more corrupt than either of these. What an inexhaustible fountain of sin has there been in it a fountain of original corruption which mingled its bitter streams with the days of early childhood, and which, alas, flows on even to this day, beyond what actions or words could express. I see this to have been the case with regard to what I can particularly survey. But, oh, how many months and years have I forgotten, concerning which I only know this in the general that they are much like those I can remember, except it be that I have been growing worse and worse, and provoking your patience more and more, though every new exercise of it was more and more wonderful. And how I am astonished that your forbearance is still continued. It is because you are God and not a man. Had I, a sinful worm, been thus injured? I could not have endured it. 
Had I been a prince, I had long since done justice on any rebel whose crimes had borne but a distant resemblance to mine. Had I been a parent, I had long since cast off the ungrateful child who had made me such a return as I have all my life long been making to you, O Father of my spirit. The flame of natural affection would have been extinguished, and a sight in his very name would have become hateful to me. Why then, O Lord, am I not cast out from your presence? Why am I not sealed up under an irreversible sentence of destruction? That I live I owe to your indulgence, but oh, if there be yet any way of deliverance, if there be yet any hope for so guilty a creature, may it be opened upon me by your gospel and your grace. And if any further alarm, humiliation, or terror be necessary to my security and salvation, may I meet them and bear them all. Wound my heart, O Lord, so that you will but afterwards heal it and break it in pieces, if you will but at length condescend to bind it up. Amen. The next chapter is called The Sinner Stripped of All His Vain Pleas. The prayer is called The Meditation of a Convinced Sinner Giving Up His Vain Pleas Before God. Deplorable condition to which I am indeed reduced. I have sinned, and what shall I say unto you, O thou preserver of men? What shall I dare to say? Fool that I was to amuse myself with such trifling excuses as these, and to imagine they could have any weight in your tremendous presence, or that I should be able so much as to mention them there. I cannot presume to do it. I am silent and confounded. My hopes, alas, are slain, and my soul itself is ready to die also, so far as an immortal soul can die, and I am almost ready to say, oh, that it could die entirely. I am indeed a criminal in the hands of justice, quite disarmed and stripped of the weapons in which I trusted. Dissimulation can only add provocation to this provocation. I will therefore plainly and freely own it. I have acted as if I thought God was altogether such an one as myself. But he has said, I will reprove you. I will set your sins in order before your eyes. I will marshal them in battle array. And oh, what a terrible kind of host do they appear. And how do they surround me beyond any possibility of an escape? Oh, my soul, they have, as it were, taken you prisoner and they are bearing you away to the divine tribunal. You must appear before it. You must see the awful, the eternal judge, who tries your very reins, and who needs no other evidence, for he has himself been witness to all your rebellion. You must see him, O my soul, sitting in judgment upon you. And when he is strict, to mark iniquity, how will you answer him for one of a thousand? And if you cannot answer him, in what language will he speak to you? Lord, of things at present stand, I can expect no other language than that of condemnation. And what a condemnation it is! Let me reflect upon it. Let me read my sentence before I hear it finally and irreversibly passed. I know you have recorded it in your word, and I know in the general that the representation is made with gracious design. I know that you would have us alarmed that we may not be destroyed. Speak to me, therefore, O God, while you speak not for the last time, and in circumstances when you will hear me no more. Speak in the language of effectual terror so that it be not to speak to me in final despair. And let your word, however painful in its operation, be quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Let me not vainly flatter myself. Let me not be left a wretched prey to those who would prophesy smooth things to me, till I am sealed up under wrath, 
and feel your justice piercing my soul and the poison of your arrows drinking up all my spirits. Before I enter upon the particular view, I know in the general that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. O oh, thou living God! In one sense I am already fallen into your hands. I am become obnoxious to your displeasure, justly obnoxious to it. And whatever your sentence may be when it comes forth from your presence, I must condemn myself and justify you. You cannot treat me with more severity than mine iniquities have deserved. And how bitter soever that cup of trembling may be, which you shall appoint for me, I give judgment against myself that I deserve to wring out the very dregs of it. Amen. The next chapter is called The Sinner Sentenced. The reflection of a sinner struck with the terror of a sentence. Wretch that I am, what shall I do, or where shall I flee? I am weighed in a balance and found wanting. This is indeed my doom, the doom I am to expect from the mouth of Christ himself, from the mouth of him that died for the redemption and salvation of men. Dreadful sentence. And so much the more dreadful when considered in that view. To what shall I look to save me from it? To whom shall I call? Shall I say to the rocks, fall upon me? And to the hills, cover me? What should I gain by that? Were I indeed overwhelmed with rocks and mountains, they could not conceal me from the notice of your eye. And your hand could reach me with as much ease there as anywhere else. Wretch indeed that I am, oh, that I had never been born. Oh, that I had never known the dignity and prerogative of the rational nature. Fatal prerogative indeed that renders me obnoxious to condemnation and wrath. Oh, that I had never been instructed in the will of God at all, rather than that being thus instructed. I should have disregarded and transgressed it. Would to God I'd been allied to the meanest of the human race, to them that come nearest to the state of the brutes, rather than that I should have had my lot in cultivated life, amid so many of the improvements of reason, and dreadful reflection, amid so many of the advantages of religion too, and thus to have perverted all to my own destruction. Oh, that God would take away this rational soul. But alas, it will live forever. It will live to feel the agonies of eternal death. Why have I seen the beauties and glories of a world like this? To exchange it for that flaming prison. Why have I tasted so many of my creator's bounties? To wring out at last the dregs of his wrath. Why have I known the delights of social life and friendly converse? To exchange them for the horrid company of devils and damned spirits in hell. Oh, who can dwell with them in devouring flames? And who can lie down with them in everlasting, everlasting, everlasting burnings? But whom have I to blame in all this but myself? What have I to accuse but my own stupid, incorrigible folly? And what is all this terrible ruin to be charged but on this one fatal cursed cause, that having broken God's law, I rejected his gospel also? Yet stay, O my soul, in the midst of all these doleful foreboding complaints. Can I say that I have finally rejected the gospel? Am I not to this day under the sound of it? The sentence has not yet gone forth against me in so determinate a manner as to be utterly irreversible. Through all this gloomy prospect, one ray of hope does break in, and that is, it is possible I may yet be delivered. Oh, reviving thought! 
Rejoice in it, O my soul, though it be with trembling. And turn immediately to that God who, though provoked by ten thousand offenses, is not yet sworn in his wrath, that you shall never be permitted to hold further intercourse with him, or to enter into his rest. O oh, then, O oh, blessed Lord, prostrate myself in the dust before you. I own I am a condemned and miserable creature. But my language is that of the humble publican. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Some general and confused apprehensions I have of a way by which I may possibly escape. O oh God, whatever that way is, show it to me. I beseech you. Point it out so plainly that I may not be able to mistake it. And O oh, reconcile my heart to it. Be it ever so humbling. Be it ever so painful. Surely, Lord, I have much to learn. But be thou my teacher. Stay for a little moment upon your uplifted hand, and in your infinite compassion delay the stroke until I inquire a little further how I may finally avoid it. Amen. The next chapter is called The Helpless State of the Sinner Under Condemnation. This prayer is called The Lamentation of a Sinner in This Miserable Condition. O doleful, uncomfortable, helpless state. O wretch that I am to have reduced myself to it. Poor, empty, miserable, abandoned creature. Where is my pride and the haughtiness of my heart? Where are my idol deities whom I have loved and served? After whom I have walked and whom I have sought? While I have been multiplying my transgressions against the majesty of heaven, is there no heart to have compassion upon me? Is there no hand to save me? Have pity upon me, have pity upon me, O oh, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. It has seized me. I feel it pressed upon me hard, and what shall I do? Perhaps they have pity upon me, but alas, how feeble a compassion. Only if there be anywhere in the whole compass of nature any help, tell me where it may be found. I'll point it out, direct me to it, or rather confounded and astonished as my mind is, take me by the hand and lead me to it. O oh, you ministers of the Lord, whose office it is to guide and comfort distressed souls, take pity upon me. I fear I am a pattern of many other helpless creatures who have the like need of your assistance. Lay aside your other cares to care for my soul, to care for this precious soul of mine, which lies, as it were, bleeding to death, if that expression may be used. While you perhaps hardly afford me a look, or glancing an eye upon me, pass over to the other side. Yet, alas, in a case like mine, what can your interposition avail if it be alone? If the Lord does not help me, how can you help me? O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, I lift up mine eyes to you, and cry to you as out of the belly of hell. I cry unto you, at least from the borders of it. Yet while I lie before you in this infinite distress, I know that your almighty power and boundless grace can still find out a way for my recovery. Thou art he whom I have most of all injured and affronted, and yet from you alone must I now seek redress. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight so that you mightest be justified when you speak, and be clear when you judge, though you should at this moment adjudge me to eternal misery. And yet I find something that secretly draws me to you, as if I might find rescue there, where I have deserved the most aggravated destruction. Bless God, I have destroyed myself, but in you is my help, if there can be help at all. I know in the general that your ways are not as our ways, 
nor your thoughts as our thoughts, but are as high above them as the heavens are above the earth. Have mercy, therefore, upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. O point out the path to the city of refuge. O lead me yourself in the way everlasting. I know in the general that your gospel is the only remedy. O teach your servants to administer it. O prepare my heart to receive it. And don't allow, as in many instances, that malignity which has spread itself through all my nature to turn your noble medicine into poison. Amen. The next chapter is called News of Salvation by Christ Brought to the Convinced and Condemned Sinner. Their prayer is called The Sinner Reflecting on This Good News. Oh, my soul, how astonishing is the message which you have this day received. I have indeed often heard it before, and it has grown so common to me that the surprise is not sensible. But reflect, oh, my soul, what it is you have heard, and say whether the name of a Savior whose message it is may not well be called Wonderful, Counselor, when he displays before you such wonders of love and proposes to you such counsels of peace. Blessed Jesus, is it indeed thus? Is it not the fiction of the human mind? Surely it is not. What human mind could have invented or conceived it? It is a plain, a certain fact that you left the magnificence and joy of the heavenly world in compassion to such a wretch as I. Oh, had you from that height of dignity and felicity only looked down upon me for one moment, and sent some gracious word to me for my direction and comfort, even by the least of your servants, justly might I have prostrated myself in grateful admiration, and have kissed the very footsteps of him that published a salvation. But did you condescend to be yourself the messenger? What grace had that been, though? You had but once in person made the declaration and immediately returned back to the throne from where divine compassion brought you down. But this is not all the triumph of your illustrious grace. It not only brought you down to earth, but kept you here in a frail and wretched tabernacle for long success of years, and at length it cost you your life, and stretched you out as a malefactor upon the cross, after you had borne insult and cruelty, which it may justly wound my heart so much as to think of. And so you have atoned, injured justice, and redeemed me to God with your own blood. What shall I say, O Lord? I do believe. Help thou mine unbelief. It seems to put faith to the stretch, to admit what it indeed exceeds, the utmost stretch of my imagination to conceive. Blessed for ever, blessed be your name, O Father of mercies, that you have contrived this way. Eternal thanks to the Lamb that was slain and to that kind providence that sent the word of his salvation to me. Oh, let me not for ten thousand worlds receive the grace of God in vain. O oh, impress this gospel upon my soul, till its saving virtue be diffused over every faculty. Let it not only be heard and acknowledged and professed, but felt. Make it your power to my eternal salvation, and raise me to that humble, tender gratitude, to that active, unwearied zeal in your service which becomes one to whom so much is forgiven. I feel a sudden glow in my heart, while these tidings are sounding in mine ears. But oh, let it not be a slight superficial transport. Oh, let not this which I would fain call my Christian joy be as that foolish laughter with which I have been so madly enchanted like the crackling blaze of thorns under a pot. 
Oh, teach me to secure this mighty blessing, this glorious hope and the method which you have appointed, and preserve me from mistaking the joy of nature while it catches a glimpse of its rescue from destruction. For that consent of grace which embraces and ensures the deliverance. Amen. The Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul Philip Doddridge